Thank you for coming today. So my name is Dr. Christina Bjornbal, and I am an naturopathic doctor. Just out of curiosity, how many people in the room have heard about orthomolecular medicine or naturopathic medicine? So just show, I mean, I see a lot of people that have at the conference this weekend. So, so for the benefit of the few of you that didn't put up your hands, I'll just explain that naturopathic doctors are trained like medical doctors in terms of the sciences. We dissect cadavers, we study pharmacology, but we, we don't use drugs to treat. And what we use is nutrition, diet, supplementation, or orthomolecular medicine, botanical medicine, uh, homeopathy, traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture, as well as counseling. And I have additional training in four types of counseling, mindfulness-based counseling, compassion-focused therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as gestalt psychotherapy. And as naturopathic doctors, what we're trying to do is figure out what the root cause may be, or causes may be, of whatever your condition may be. And we really are interested in knowing as much as we can about you as an individual, and restoring your body back to a state of balance as, as best as we can using those modalities that I mentioned. So in my own case, I haven't always been a naturopathic doctor, and I've had a lot of challenges in the area of mental health, and I'm going to go over a few of those with you today, share with you some of my experience, and then talk a little bit about how I work with patients. So it started for me primarily in high school when I developed an eating disorder, and, and I was bulimic. And that's something that I, I hid from everybody. It was, it was something that not very many people knew about. I was also very overachieving and was the top student. Was the, wasn't enough to just be the top student. I also was the top athlete. And I continued that overachieving behavior into university. But by my third year of university, I had my first debilitating depression, suicidal uh, ideations, and was paralyzed with anxiety. This was the fall of 1987. I was then put on an antidepressant. By that spring, I had a week of little to no sleep and had swung into a full-blown delusional psychotic manic episode. It took eight people, my mom, my boyfriend at the time, three police officers and three paramedics to, to get me into a straight jacket and off I went to the hospital where I was injected with Halperidol and left in a rubber room to come back to, to come down from that episode. So I was then labeled with bipolar disorder type 1 and basically sent on my way. I was prescribed lithium and that medication at that time I had a hard time tolerating. I, I developed the really really strong hand tremors, and a lot of people actually thought I had Parkinson's. Um, so it's, it's a medication that later on in life I wouldn't visit, but at that time uh, I ended up being changed to a different mood stabilizer called Tegretol, and also was added with carbamazepine. So the following fall, when I entered my fourth year of university, was basically a repeat of the prior year. I fell into another major depression, anxiety, and then I swung into another manic episode after being prescribed an antidepressant. Unfortunately, this time I was in Mexico, and the uh, authorities there thought I was doing drugs and threatened to put me into prison, but thankfully my friends were there to advocate for me. When I came back to Canada, I, was, uh, I went into the UBC psychiatric ward, where I spent two months, and I actually finished my degree on a day pass, and then I would go back to the hospital at night. I was nominated class valedictorian, I graduated at the top of my class, my parents were extremely proud of me, but I was really stuck in the shame and the stigma of, of being a bipolar. It was something that I had, I hadn't even really accepted the first diagnosis of depression and, and general anxiety and social anxiety. Uh, I really only understood depression in the economic sense of the word as I was a commerce student at ABC. But, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a difficult thing for me to accept within myself. 
So upon graduation, I ended up working, and I worked uh, for the same financial institution for 10 years. Within six years, that, that uh, overachieving behavior still continued. I ended up reporting to the CEO of the Investment Management Division. But in 1994, I had a, a severe suicide attempt that left me uh, with kidney failure, in a coma. Uh, on, when I came out of that coma, I, had, I was on dialysis. was told I needed a kidney transplant, but thankfully my kidneys made a full recovery. And, and that really was the turning point for me in terms of, of my, my health. I was given a book to read by a friend called A Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. And in that book, she talked about a study with two groups of AIDS patients. In one group, the, this, the group had positive support from their community and family members, and the other group was shunned from their community and was living with the stigma and shame of being homosexual and didn't feel that they could live openly with their sexuality. So they studied the outcomes of these two groups of individuals, the prognosis, severity of symptoms, lifespan, and not surprisingly, the group that had the positive community support did much, much better than the group that didn't. And this is where the light bulb went off for me. It dawned on me that up until that point, I did not accept the illness or the diagnosis, and I didn't accept myself. So I started seeing a naturopathic doctor in 1996, and then in 1999, I came to this form, as you have come today, as somebody who wanted to have my mental health regained. I saw this same clip showed. Dr. Hoffman was the speaker at that time. And thankfully, I'm from the West Coast. Dr. Hoffman was practicing in Victoria. I got a referral to him. I became his patient. And within one year of starting his nutritional protocol, which included B3, niacinamide, zinc, probiotics, um, omega-3s. I had my first year of that I was free from depression and anxiety for an entire 12 months. Prior to that, I, I had some glimpses of, of uh, being relieved from the thoughts that plagued me, but for the most part, I was in a state of depression or was experiencing anxiety for the 15 years prior to that. So to me, that was remarkable, and I thought, my golly, this cannot be the only guy in the country that can be helping people. And at that time, he was, he was close to 80 years old. So I took stock of my life, and I asked myself one question. If money didn't matter, what would I be doing with my life? And the answer that came up for me was, you go back to school and become an orthomolecular practitioner. So I called the Open Molecular Society. I asked, how do you do that? How do you become an orthomolecular practitioner? And the person I spoke to on the phone said, well, you have to either be a medical doctor or a naturopathic doctor. And I had already gone to an old boys club at the bank. And so I didn't really, no offense to any medical doctors out there, but I didn't really feel like joining another uh, old boys club. So anyways, I went on to naturopathic school. I had to go back to high school. To, to get the education because the first time around I didn't do the, the science route. So when I'm working with patients, what I explain to them is there's three macro systems in your body that we're, we're trying to support. You've got your neurotransmitters, your neuroendocrine system, and your organs of detoxification. In terms of your neurotransmitters, you have six of them, serotonin, GABA, norepinephrine, epinephrine, dopamine, and glutamate. And what's really important to understand is that everything that you put into your body informs your body. It's either going to be supported in the formation of those neurotransmitters, or it's going to be a deterrent or considered a toxin to your body. In terms of your neuroendocrine system, you have, that's a system of glands that produce hormones. And what's important to understand is that a symptom of many of these hormone imbalances is depression and anxiety. So you have to recognize that you don't exist in silos or vacuums within your body. All these things are integrated and working together and affecting each other. And it's the balance of which that is going to support your mental well-being. 
So the way I go about supporting those areas is I start with the four foundational pillars, which is diet, sleep, exercise, and managing stress. In terms of the sleep piece, in terms of somebody who has schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, that is a really important area to manage. I mean, who in the room has, has had a night without any sleep? I mean, I'm sure most of us have. Uh, it's, it's fundamental to your well-being to get that rest and, rest, rest and regeneration that you need. And in terms of exercise, it's, it's been said that the most overutilized prescription for depression and anxiety are pharmaceuticals. And the most underutilized prescription is exercise. Now, don't get me wrong, I know firsthand how hard it is to get yourself moving if you're depressed. And I can tell you that there are days when the only thing I accomplished in a day was getting from my bedroom to the front door and getting out. And sometimes that took me two, four, six, ten hours to just move you know, that few hundred feet that I needed to. But I can tell you this, not once, not once did I ever come back feeling worse than when I went out. So sometimes the very thing you're resisting is exactly the medicine you need. The next areas that I work on with patients are your thoughts, your emotions, how you behave and react in the world, your environment, and spirituality. I then try to wrap that all up in compassion and love for yourself. Because at the end of the day, that's what it all comes down to. Do you love yourself enough to take the steps that I'm going to ask you to take and to make the changes that are necessary in your life to move from a state of mental disease to mental wellness? And I just want to touch on the environmental piece quickly because one of the things that I was told was, you know, when anybody who's been diagnosed with a mental health condition generally is going to ask the question at some point, why? Why me? Why is this happening to me? And the answer I got was, well, it's genetic. So you just have to accept that and take your medication, and that's, that's it. That's all there is to it. And that didn't sit well with me. First of all, I'm adopted, so I didn't have that genetic uh, benefit of understanding my genetics. And the interesting thing is, the reason I was adopted was in my family, there is a genetic disease that my grandfather had, which is Huntington's Korea, which is a very severe neurological, degenerative neurological condition, which is, is really three mental health conditions in one. It's Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, and Parkinson's. But I've come to believe that telling patients that it's all in your genes leaves them feeling a victim, leaves them feeling like they cannot do anything to change their genetic disposition. And I often say to my patients, genes load the gun, lifestyle pulls the trigger. And this is the field of epigenetics, what turns genes on and off. And this is what I'm essentially discussing in these few short minutes, is that diet and supplementation have play a critical role in the expression of your genes. So, oh, over the last 30 years, I've seen a, a, a real shift in the conversation around mental health. When I was initially diagnosed back in 1987, there was no conversation. None. Now, there's a conversation. With the death of Robin Williams last summer and his suicide, that conversation got a little bit louder for a little bit of time after his suicide. But what I want you to remember is that 3,600 people a year commit suicide in this country. That's 10 people a day. So for the two hours that we're having this conversation, somebody is going to commit suicide. And I think that is the silent epidemic that's going on in our country and around the world. Dr. Greenblatt this morning gave a statistic that was shocking to me that by 2020, someone's going to commit suicide globally every 20 seconds. 
So what I'd like to do, and the whole point of the Cayman Ashkata culture, was to help people who are suffering like I have from whether it's an eating disorder, depression, anxiety, social or general, bipolar disorder, whatever your affliction, let me stand as a signal of hope, inspiration, empowerment, that you can get mentally well. When Robin Williams died, I wrote this poem, which is what I'll conclude with, and it's basically, the poem is open, see, feel, believe, change. Open your mind, open your eyes, open your heart to the belief that change can happen. See through your mind, see through your eyes, see through your heart that change happening. Feel through your mind, feel through your eyes, feel through your heart the change in beauty. Open, see, feel, believe, change. Thank you.